Hello everyone, this is Rohan Shah with BestEconTutor.com and in this module we'll be talking about PPF, Opportunity Cost, and Trading, including Comparative and Absolute Advantage. So, the first thing is opportunity cost. What if you have uh, an option to go to college where the tuition is $20,000, but you have a couple of alternatives. You could, instead of going to college, you could have a job, and let's say that job would pay you $30,000. Or, instead, you could start your own business where you'd get $50,000 expected revenues with a $10,000 cost of operating. So, here's the question. What is your opportunity cost of going to college? Now, here's how we define opportunity cost. Opportunity cost is the net value of the next best alternative. So what that means is, let's first look at all our, our alternatives to going to college. Well, the alternative one of going to college is having a job, so that's a $30,000 value. The other alternative to going to college is starting your own business, and that has a net value, meaning how much you could get out of that after your costs, of $40,000. Because the $50,000 revenues, but you do have to spend the 10K, so net you're getting 40,000 if you were to start your business, but only $30,000 for the job. So, while your physical cost of going to college is the $20,000 tuition, your opportunity cost, meaning the value, the net value of the next best alternative, would be $40,000. Now, production possibilities frontiers, or production possibilities curves. Suppose you live in a world where there's no such thing as currency, and there's only two goods, Ferraris and slippers. Now, uh, suppose on one, on one axis you measured how much slippers you can make, and on the y-axis, you measured how many Ferraris you can make. Now, any point on this whole plane would really be what we call a bundle, because it's a certain amount of slippers and a certain amount of Ferraris. So, if you were to graph all the points that you can produce, that it's possible to produce, well, that's your production possibilities curve. So, here, if we were to look at this graph, these, would be, these points would be the production possibilities curve, now, any point on the inside over here, for example, would be considered inefficient because you are able to make more of not just one, but both goods, right? You're able to make more of both goods. So that's why if you stop production at this point, that's inefficient. Anything on the line is efficient because what that means is to make any more of one good. If you wanted to make another pair of slippers, you're going to have to make fewer Ferraris. And so that's why there's that trade-off. That's why PPFs, PPCs, they always slope downwards because of the trade-off. Now, anywhere outside the PPF is simply impossible to produce. Now, looking at this, how can we relate what we just talked about, opportunity cost, with production possibilities curves? Well, remember that it's the value of the next best alternative. But how do you measure cost in a world without currency? Well, it's going to be in terms of the other good, the good that you're giving up, the good that you're not producing anymore. So here, if we wanted to look at the cost, what's the cost of making a Ferrari? Well, here we can use this formula that the cost of the good is the amount of the other good that you're giving up. So the cost of good X would simply be the amount of good Y that you're giving up divided by the amount of good X and the other way around. So here, how much it co uh, the cost of making 10 Ferraris would simply be 100 slippers. So here the opportunity cost of a Ferrari would be 100 slippers over 10 Ferraris. So that simply equals 10. 100 over 10 simplifies to 10. So that's what we'd say. We'd say that the cost of a Ferrari is 10 slippers. Likewise, if you were to take the reciprocal that'd be the cost of a slipper. The cost of a slipper is simply 10 Ferraris over 100 slippers, so that's 
10 over 100, so that's 1 tenth. So one thing you might notice here is the cost of good x is simply change in y over change in x. That formula might be familiar from you from math class, from algebra. That's the slope. The slope of the line of the PPF is simply the opportunity cost of the x-axis good. And the opportunity cost of the y-axis good is the reciprocal of that. So now what if your PPF looked something like this, where it wasn't just a straight line, where it was a curve like this? Well, in that case, all we have is that the opportunity cost is not constant. It's not the same cost everywhere at all these different points. Here, it's the same cost everywhere because it's the same slope everywhere. Here, as you produce more slippers, the cost of slippers go up because it's a steeper slope. Now, one thing to keep in mind, if you're given the values in terms of how many hours it takes to make a good, rather than how many of the goods you can produce, then the opportunity cost, it's actually uh, measured the other way around. So instead of opportunity cost of x, there's actually two ways to measure it. It's either how, how many units of y you're giving up divided by how many units of x, or it's actually the time it takes to make one item of x over the time it takes to make one item of y. So notice here, the opportunity cost of x in that case will have x on top and y on bottom if you're given the times as opposed to the number of units where it's the other way around. So here, for example, if you were given that it takes you 14 hours to make a Ferrari and only one hour to make a slipper, and then if you wanted to know the cost of a Ferrari, in that case, you wouldn't do slipper over Ferrari. You'd do the time it takes to make a Ferrari, so that's time for Ferrari, 14 hours, over the time it takes to make a slipper, one hour, so that's simply 14. So then you could say that the opportunity cost of a Ferrari is 14 slippers. So now, looking at trading, what if we have two countries, China and Peru, and they can make two goods, rice or tomatoes, and we're wondering, could they benefit by trading with each other? Well, there's two things economists look at, absolute advantage and comparative advantage. Now, absolute advantage is simply saying who can make more of that good per worker. Now, let's assume for this problem that Peru and China have the same number of workers. If they didn't, you'd just have to divide how much they can make totally by the number of workers. So here, Peru can make 50 units of rice and China can make 200 units of rice. So, simply because China can make more, uh, they have the absolute advantage for rice. Now, for tomatoes, same thing. China can make 100 tomatoes and Peru can make 50 tomatoes. So China has the absolute advantage again. Now notice it's clearly possible to have the absolute advantage for both of the goods, or you can also only have the absolute advantage for one of the goods if we change the numbers around, or for neither of the goods. Now here's the thing though. What economists look at is comparative advantage. That's really what matters more. Because if we wanted to decide trading based on absolute advantage, we'd say that China has to make both goods. But really what matters is the comparative advantage. And what that is, is that it's who has the lower opportunity cost for making that good. That's why we looked at opportunity cost earlier in this video. Now let's put it to use. So, what is Peru's opportunity cost for tomatoes? Well, let's see. Their opportunity cost for tomatoes is the amount of rice over tomato, so 50 over 50. So that's equal to one. Now, what is China's opportunity cost for tomatoes? Well, 200 rice over 100 tomatoes, which is two. So their cost is one, their cost is two. For cost, we're looking for the lower cost, right? So Peru actually wins. They have the lower opportunity cost for tomatoes compared to China. So that's why they have the comparative advantage for tomatoes. Now the cool thing about comparative advantage is if you know that one country or one person has the comparative advantage for one good, the other person automatically has it for the other good. We could do the math to prove why, but that'll always be the case. So it's actually impossible mathematically for you to have the comparative advantage for both goods. Uh, if we were to do the math, just to sort of verify, if we wanted to look at the cost now not of tomatoes, but of rice, Peru's cost of rice would be 50 over 50, still 1. But now China's cost of rice would be 100 over 200, which is a half. And a half 
is less than one. So no matter what, if you have the lower opportunity cost for one of the goods, since the other opportunity cost is the reciprocal anyways, then you're gonna be the higher opportunity cost for the other goods. So that's why one country will specialize in one good and the other will specialize in the other. And that's why if you trade based on comparative advantage, what you can do is you can then after trading, consume a point outside of your original PPF. So a previously impossible point for both countries is now attainable. You can't really produce that point directly, but after specializing and trading, you can consume a point for both countries outside of your PPF. And that's why there are always gains from trade. Now, suppose that the production technologies for one of your goods has improved. Suppose that you can make either fish and chips and you found a much better way to catch fish. Well now, your PPF then will actually shift a little bit. Now, if you're better at making fish, instead of 60, you can make more fish. But since your technology for chips hasn't really changed, you can still only make 60 uh, chips. So that's why your PPF will kind of shift out in this way. Now, of course, if you had a technological improvement that helped you make more of both fish and chips, then it would shift from this out to something like this, where both intercepts go up. Right? So that's how uh, your PPF can shift if, if it becomes easier to make a good, to produce a good. Notice it's not at all based on the demand for that good. So just because you start liking chips more or fish more won't really shift the PPF at all. That's just based on what you're able to produce. Demand for the good is kind of what we're going to see in the next module. So here we have a question from a student. Why is the opportunity cost not the sum of all of my alternatives and just the next best one? That's a good question. Suppose instead of going to college, you're deciding whether to take a job or not. And let's say you have a bunch of job offers. Let's say you have one job offer for $40,000 a year and 99 other job offers that are all $30,000 a year. Well, your opportunity cost isn't really adding up all those uh, job offers, but really you wouldn't be able to take all those jobs, right? You'd only be able to take one of them. And so you'd probably pick the one with the highest income. And so that's why what you're really giving up by going to college is just the $40,000, just the next best alternative. That's why that's what opportunity cost is. It's just the next best alternative, not the sum of all the alternatives. Now here we have another question from a student. When calculating opportunity cost, how do I know what to put in my numerator and what to put in my denominator? It seems to change every time. Good question. It can be confusing sometimes. What should you put for your numerator and what should you put for your denominator? Well, usually when you're looking at the amount of the good, it's always the opposite good that you put in the numerator because that's what you're giving up. You're giving up the other good. So let's say, for example, that we, it takes you two hours to make an apple and one hour to make an orange. Now, however, because you're not given the amount of the good, but rather the time, here you actually want to use that good itself on, on top. So that's why it is, it is confusing, but here's the issue. The simple way you can remember it is the opportunity cost of good X is either the change in Y over change in X, so it's the opposite good on top if you're looking at the amount of the good, versus it's also equal to the time it takes for good x versus the time it takes for good y. Now here, let's actually see why you get the same answer both ways. Here, you could look at the opportunity cost of apples and say the opportunity cost of apples is the time it takes to make an apple, two hours over the time for an orange, one. So the opportunity cost is two. But here's a totally different way we could have done it. Let's say you have 100 hours well, in those 100 hours, if you just wanted to make apples, you'd be able to make, well, let's see, uh, two, uh, two hours each, so you'd be able to make 50 apples in those 100 hours, because it takes two hours to make each. But oranges, one hour each, you have 100 hours, so you can make 100 oranges in that time. So it really doesn't matter what time you choose, you can just pick a time, and here what we'll find is if we were to make our PPF, we now have twice as many oranges 
as apples, which makes sense because it takes half as long to make one. So using this formula, if we wanted to find the opportunity cost of an apple here, we do oranges over apples, so that's 100 oranges over 50 apples, 100 over 50, which is two. Same as we got earlier. So it really doesn't matter which way you do it, it's all about being consistent. If you're given the amount of the good, use the opposite good, y over x is the cost of x. But if you're given the time it takes to make it, then the opportunity cost of x is time of x over time of y. Well, I hope you now understand economics better. And if you really want to make sure you've mastered the concept, check out our active learning customized platform at bestecontutor.com. It's like having a one-on-one -on -one tutor right in front of you 24-7. You can click here to try it out for free. And we'll be adding more topics and videos on YouTube, so make sure you subscribe below for the latest updates.